All right. So let's get started. Let me quickly go over the test, um, and then um, I'll open up for questions about homework for today. And then we'll continue where we left off on Friday with any remaining time. Uh, so, uh, question number one, I just ask you to describe problem types. Uh, normally, if I took off points, usually it was, uh, and I oftentimes would note this with like more dot dot dot, I was just looking for a more detailed description than, than you gave in those situations. Uh, there weren't any common issues that, that showed up. Um, across the board. Maybe with question four, I mean, um, see, sorry, there was an issue where some people would not, uh, would say it was allocating assets and just leave it there, and there wasn't any discussion about trying to balance risk versus reward in, in that. Um, they would be the only common scenario. Um, so I won't spend too much time on that. Uh, Question two here. Uh, question two was meant to be like a problem in your textbook where you had the um, rental cars that you're trying to distribute across the country. This time it was um, trucks instead, truck rentals. Um, and so uh, I didn't count it wrong and try to accommodate this because it is a transshipment problem, but it makes it harder if you dealt with it where you uh, had it as a transportation problem uh, and did something like uh, this where you had some trucks here, and, uh, some locations here, and just tried to make connections here and had your supply and your demand. You could do it this way, you could do it correctly, but it was difficult because oftentimes there's like this connection here between um, Atlanta and Greensboro. Uh, and there's also oftentimes connections here between Cincinnati and Louisville or, or Pittsburgh. And it stops looking like this ni nicely defined graph where you just have supply on one side and you just have demand on the other side. So if instead you treated it as a generic um, network problem, maybe it looks like this, or this is New Orleans, um, St. Louis, um, Cincinnati, Louisville, uh, Pittsburgh, Greenboro and Atlanta, then it's easier to draw the graph, first of all, <laughs> because it is kind of geographically based. And then what you can do is you can annotate each of these edges. I won't do it here right now, but as an example, you could say that this takes 676 or this one takes 350, as well as whether a node is a supplier or a receiver by doing something like this. St. Louis is a supplier because it has 115 extra, whereas Cincinnati is a receiver because it needs 50 trucks to, to be able to um, receive what it needs. Um, and once you do that, then it becomes a little bit easier to kind of do the rest of, of the model because now you're just thinking about <coughs> um, supply constraints for the ones that have the positive, demand constraints the ones that have negative, and, and making sure that um, you do that uh, appropriately. So um, then what I was looking for was something like uh, minimize because we don't want to pay extra cost. Something like 332x13. And then this is probably one of the most common errors in, in section B. 
is forgetting to include the fact that the trucks can go both ways on this, these routes. And that's really important because this is a plus and this is a plus and you might want to send some of Atlanta through Greensboro to Pittsburgh. Right, so you can't just say they are only sending stuff out. They may need to receive stuff and pass it on to the to their next um, people. And, and you keep going plus four seventy x one four plus four seventy x four one. And I'm not going to do them all here because you have the table of all the connections. And you just have to make sure that you include all those connections in this constraint here. Subject two, and now you're going to have one constraint for each one of these nodes. So I'll do the St. Louis node as an example with a node that has 115, and the Cincinnati node that has uh, minus. So the St. Louis node um, is, uh, what we want is the ingoing, all right there, the ingoing minus the outgoing, or let me do it this way, the outgoing minus the ingoing should be 115. We should send 115 more out than we send in, all right? Versus our Cincinnati, we reverse it. The ingoing minus the outgoing should equal 50. Because we should have more coming in than going out. So all we do, um, let me label these. Uh, four, two, what is that, six, and five. Right? So for St. Louis, we want out. So that's x to 4 plus x to 5 plus x to 6 minus our incoming. We just switch the order of all these, right? x 4 2 plus x 5 2 plus x 6 2 equals 115. And if we don't want those parentheses in there, we can distribute this negative across that. And, and we would do the same sort of thing for Atlanta and Greensboro as we do here for St. Louis. <coughs> for Cincinnati, we just flip it. Um, it's pretty good. Seven, right? So what is coming in? Well, that's um, x25 plus x65 plus x75. And what's going out, again, is the opposite order. Right? Five two plus x five six plus x five seven, and that needs to be equal to. All right. So by far, the biggest difficulty in here was forgetting the bidirectionality of these connections. <coughs> And um, uh, if you organize it like this, it was a little bit easier to remember that bidirectionality. If you treated it like a transportation problem, it was easier to forget that directionality. Okay. But it wasn't wrong to do it as a supply on the left, command on the right. It just made it harder mentally to move in that direction. <coughs> All right, uh, question three was fantastic. Um, I don't remember marking any significant points off of part A. Maybe there was a typo that someone, or a copy of, whatever the case might be, um, for there. But it was clear to me that as a class, you guys really understood how to do this transshipment problem. And, and so that was, that was great. Um, if there's a problem on part B, it was um, usually uh, forgetting to look at the total supply and the total demand. Right? So if you count up the total supply, 
there are 260 units. Uh, but if you look up the total demand, there are 290 units. If I'm kind of crazy, yes. uh, so that means there's more demand than supply. So we need to send everything out of every supply. So it's really important that, the, that we set it to equal, or I would have accepted uh, greater than but equal as well. But less than or equal is strictly not allowed because then it would allow less to be shipped out than we want because we absolutely have to use a less than or equal on our demand constraints because they're not going to get everything. Um, and so if we make both sides less than or equal, our solver will say, I know how to make both sides less than or equal. I'll make them zero. right? And so you had to make sure that you had x14 plus x15 is equal to 72. Uh, parts uh, C and D, most of you got correctly. Actually, I didn't mean for both of them to be internal nodes. That was a that was a think of on my part as I was writing the test bowling for, for all of you. I meant it to be Ohio, Indiana, and Virginia, and I accidentally typed Georgia. So. Oh well, I have to grade what I write, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So on to what I think was the most difficult question based on how you responded. Um, not that I was necessarily intending it to be difficult, but I think um, looking back at maybe why it was, was you hadn't seen a question like this on one of the practice exams, so maybe you didn't prepare for it as fully as um, maybe some of the other problem types. Okay? But you had done a, a question like this in your homework. It was, I think, the last question before the exam came due. So this was a, a production one. And I'll be honest, I, when I went through it to start and got my sample solution, I gave the wrong sample solution, and uh, several of you caught that correctly in your exams that I didn't initially. So, good job for everyone there. Uh, <clears throat> there are two uh, easy ways, uh, or two, not easy ways, there are two primary ways that people could have diagrammed this out. One is uh, basically you have each month where you produce things. Uh, extra, so January, uh, February, and March, and you see those as producing, was it uh, 30? And then you have the months that receive those, like April, May, June, and July. And then you can just connect this. That would be 150. That would be 200, 250, and 300 like that. And then you connect these in a similar manner here. I don't want to make it impossible to read. Um, and that gives you making the stuff ahead of time. Okay. Then all you have to do is um, add the overtime. And it's really important that you uh, don't include the overtime in part of your inventory. Because at the very end of the question, it says they produce up to 20 engines in the month they are due. So you can't produce overtime engines for a future month. You had to produce them for the month they were due. So one way you could do that is April has 20, and it only goes to April here, or 400. And you have a May, a June, and July, and they connect up that as well. So that one then, then looks a lot like a transportation problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that's missing here is what do we put for our demand? And what we put for our demand is what they wanted minus what they knew they were going to supply. Because 
uh, we only need the extra that's demanded. And so I have here that being 20, 25, 10, and 70. Okay. So that's one way to do it. An alternative way uh, is to just um, follow the inventory as it goes through, through the system. So you can have January can produce 30, and then it sends that to the next one, which is February, which can produce 30, and sends it on to March, which produces 30. And now things get a little bit tricky right here. We need to make sure that April if we go 50 here like this we don't and we go main here we don't put our April over time like this and the reason why this is a mistake is because now the April overtime can go down this inventory, which it's not supposed to do. Right. So you need to have a separate outgoing node right here and maybe you make this a zero and this is where you put your demand of 20 per April. Okay. And now the overtime can't keep going down the inventory line right here. All right. And so then May would have the same thing with another overtime and 50 down and so forth. So these were the two primary ways that people successfully did this. All right. <clears throat> All right. For question five, <clears throat> you had to look at the sensitivity analysis. Um, and again, I would recommend that you lay out your graph in geographical um, order because then you're not going to have lines that, that cross. Um, that didn't make it any wrong to have the lines cross, but it oftentimes made it so people missed the line somewhere because they thought they had connected something else to the uh, the, the interesting things about this you know, graph is, is that it was not symmetric. Right? So for instance, LA to Denver had routes to Denver of 7, but back from Denver at 9. Right here. So you couldn't just look at one connection between LA and Denver and say, oh, there's seven between the two of them. All right? So you had to actually look at both directions and label them correctly. Uh, the other interesting one, uh, Phoenix only had routes in this direction, didn't have returning flights from Denver. Uh, so most of you did a good job on um, looking at the connections and um, there were two primary problems that showed up. Uh, the first one is you'll remember that this is a max flow problem. Right? We're going to see how many flights can get from LA 
all the way to Chicago. And the way we do that is we add a fake route from Chicago back to LA. That doesn't really exist, but we allow our uh, computer to pretend like it does, and we set this to a value that should, for all intents and purposes, be infinity. On uh, our computer thing, we did 99, because it was much bigger than anything else in there. So if you did a dotted line like this, um, and indicated you understood that it was an augmenting graph, great, I didn't count that against you. But if you made this a solid line, and you put 99 in there, to me the only way I can interpret that is that you thought that there was a flight going from Chicago directly back to LA. Um, and so I had to take points off of that. Because there wasn't really a flight in there, we added that in order to solve the problem. <clears throat> All right, so that was one mistake that was fairly common. The second mistake that was fairly common is that um, there were two numbers that you could look at for connecting flights between these two. Um, I'll take another one right here, like Salt Lake City um, had 10 in this direction and 10 in this direction. But there weren't 10 flights that were actually taken. There were just 10 flights that were possible to take. Um, the actual number of flights that were taken was 6 flights that were actually taken. So if you, if you put a graph on here where you put the actual flights that were taken rather than the potential flights that were taken, um, you got the, the wrong answer. You got a much more minimal uh, looking flight. Uh, and I recently uh, looked at uh, this with one student and realized that I um, over penalized you if that's what you did. So if, that, if you made that mistake, I need to give you points back on this. So make sure you turn this back into me so I can grade that uh, better. So you will get more points than I initially gave you uh, for that mistake. All right, so. Wait, so how, um, how could we even have seen that? that it was uh, so if you look at the sensitivity analysis, yeah. you're going to look at the constraints part of it, right? Mm -hmm. Too many hands here. Um, and what you're going to see as an example here, between LA and Salt Lake City, uh, is you'll see that the final value is six, right? That's how many flights actually went between those. But if you look at the right-hand side value, the number was ten. And the reason why is because this ten was a constraint. Somewhere in there, there was a constraint that said the flights from LA to Salt Lake City had to be less than or equal to 10, okay. right? But that's, that's what our max flow needs in order to not spend too much stuff yeah. on any one link. So this is the right-hand side of that constraint, which is the 10, yeah. and the value that we ended up putting in this variable yeah. is the 6. No, I, I, I do get that, but I... So for that question, you want us to go through all the... All the flights between each city and then put the actual final value. I wanted you to put, no, I wanted you to put the constraining value. Oh. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. I, I think I'm, I'm on the, the, the question B. Yeah, and then for question B, I'm wanting this value. Okay, for each. Okay. Yes. Because I, yeah, I did just, I guess, the total number of flights. Right. The key was between each city. Yeah. All right. So, so B, I was looking for each flight, each connection, how many actually went between them. In C, I was looking for the number that went on this augmented path, which was 18. I didn't. Yes. I just. I feel like for this question, it would have been more um, intuitive to say just um, what are the number of flights 
that actually took place between each cities. Because the, the, the word total number kind of then makes us think that we have to to know the total number of flights. Because you know that was some of everything. Because it's I don't know. Okay. That, that was just my thinking. But. All right. I'll, I'll think about that. Dude. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, I'll think about that. Um, question B. Um, what you had to do is you had to look at the shadow price. Right? A bottleneck is a connection where if you increase its capacity, you, you increase the total capacity that flows through the system right here. And so you're looking for something that has a shadow price that's non-zero because it, it's going to increase the objective value, and this is our objective value. So you look for a shadow price that's non-zero on a, a something that has a link. So you can't look, I don't remember if it does, between Denver and Phoenix if there is a shadow price here because there is no flight there. So that, that's like saying, hey, if you opened up a new connection, you could get more stuff through that. Well, great, I could just connect directly from LA to Chicago and make it bigger, right? That's, that's outside the realm of, of feasibility. Um, so it, it's not, that's not the bottleneck, the fact that we don't have LA to Chicago. The bottleneck is that um, the three ones that look like bottlenecks were Denver to Chicago, KC to Chicago, and St. Louis to Chicago. Um, because they're Shadow prices were down zero. One student, I think it was only one student, rightly pointed out of those three that only one of them actually had a uh, um, available increase uh, that was non-zero. Um, that even I missed as well. So I actually gave extra credit to that student for that observation. All right. Uh, where's the last page? Here we go. All right. For the game theory problem, this is a mixed uh, strategy. I think everyone correctly identified that. Um, and most people correctly identified, uh, did the work um, for the, the game to be able to um, to be able to figure out what was happening. So we have um, A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, 10, 4, 6, 9, 7, 8, 3, 5, negative 4. And you, you all correctly said that it would be 3, 4, negative 4 here, um, and 10, 9, Five here, and then you compare these and show that they were not equal. All right. So, so what I was looking for is this work here that showed that you computed these values, even though you didn't have to say anything. I needed to see this work somewhere, and everyone did work like this. Most of you did correct this exact work. Um, and then said that because these are two unequal, there is not an equilibrium point here that uh, if the um, cooler cola chooses strategy C and smoothie chooses strategy 2, there's going to be incentive for them to want to switch their, their strategies to something else. Uh, and so that's why it's a mixed strategy. All right. Uh, there are a lot of answers to question B, um, but a lot of them ended up accidentally causing a non-equilibrium point because you chose a value that tied rather than it was clearly larger, clearly smaller than the value that you wanted. So it turns out that that tie still incentivizes one of the two parties to want to switch uh, what it, its strategy is unfortunately. So uh, most of you got six out of eight points because you sh showed that you understood that it shouldn't, you have to turn something 
so that they become equal, but didn't quite uh, understand that nuance of, of the equilibrium. Yes? Can you explain that a little more? Because I thought in a pure strategy that like both the companies would end up picking a solution with the same outcome. So, yeah, it depends upon which way you went. So, uh, let me see. Um, so, some people would turn this to a four. Right, so that makes this a four, and then they're equal. You're like, okay, great, they're equal, therefore it works. But because this is a four and this is a four, there's incentive for cooler polar to switch here, because then they could get an increased uh, return on their investment. So because there's a tie here, there, there's that perverse incentive. So um, all that would have had to happen is to change. Um, so this was a five, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, it is it is change um, it from being an equal to being a non-equal, and then and then um, make it the new strategy. So when I was thinking of the question, immediately I thought would be a great thing to do is to turn this to a six or something. Okay? And the reason why that is that option number one is always better for smoothing, right? This is always better than these two options, this is always better than these two options, and this is always better than these two options. So smooth is So, so smoother is never going to want to move off of option number one. It's what's called a dominant strategy. It, and so because of that, um, it doesn't matter what cooler cola does, smoothie is always going to stay here. And then smoother is, uh, and then cooler cola is going to say, well, if you're always going to pick this strategy, well, of course I'm always going to pick this strategy. I'm never going to want to deviate to one of these other strategies. It's just going to hurt me even worse. So that's a situation where there's not a tie, and so there's not that incentive to move that out uh, elsewhere. Yes? So are you suggesting that this is an example of a pure strategy? Yes. Um, so does that violate our description of pure strategy that they have equilibrium? No, there, there is equilibrium. It's just not equal to. It is equal to, right? So this would turn to 6, and we would be comparing 6 to 6. Oh, OK. All right. I think, or at least in my my, I think what tricked me up was I thought I'd switch one number, but use one of the previous numbers from the next strategy solution. I think that's why many people might have changed that five to a four. Yeah, there were I I yeah. saw this across. Yeah. Uh, almost every so number in here was changed by by yeah. some student. Yeah. So, uh, but oftentimes they chose it number rather than an increasing or a decreasing number that would have pushed it into that equilibrium. Alright, so if you, um, if I, on question five, if you answered with the number of flights that were sent rather than the flights that could have been sent, turn it back in so I can update your your score appropriately. Or, or yeah, on, on the grade sheet, I want to be able to do that for you. All right? That was my whirlwind tour. Um, Are there any questions about uh, the test or the um, homework for today? Yes? Yeah, um, are all the videos on YouTube, are they going to be available? I put up the video from Friday uh, around noon or 1 today. Um, and I will try to put this up for today's video in the next, I'll, I'll try to get it up quickly. Okay. I just, 
I can't upload these yeah. files from my home. It, ta it literally takes yeah, yeah. 30 to 40 hours. That's, that's, okay. um, Thank you. So I have to do it from, from work. So yeah, it will be put up, but I can't guarantee there will be uh, enough yeah. time for you to watch it and to do the, the homework assignment when it's the next day. But that's why I'm intentionally saying come to class where you need it. All right, so let's continue where we left off on Friday. So if you remember, we had we had this lease strategy, which was um, our monthly cost. Our mileage allowance and the surcharge if we went above our mileage allowance. And we had three possible leases here. $299, $300, $400. Forty-five k and fifty-four k. Fifteen cents, twenty cents, and fifteen cents. And then uh, at the very end of class, I produced what the actual cost will be for three mileage uh, scenarios. One is our low mileage, which is um, twelve k per year. One is for our medium, or 15k per year, and one is for our high, or 18k per year. And this was 10, 7, 6, 4, 12, 1, 4, and 13. Four, six, sixteen, all right, and that's where we left off on Friday. Okay, so let's go through some decision making strategies here and see how they play off. All right, the first one uh, might be called um, optimistic. Um, and uh, in this case, what you do is you take the best result uh, with, with the, be the best possible option that it could occur and the best result from that best possible option. So in the optimistic case, we're going to look at all these different costs and say, well, the 12000 per year is always going to be the best option for us. And of that option, the lease A is going to be our best. And so from an optimistic standpoint, we're going to choose lease A. OK? Does it make sense how the optimistic choice says you should go with lease A? All right. In these cases, um, you often do a strategy that is either what's called maxi max or mini min, which basically means you minimize along one dimension and you minimize along another dimension, or you maximize along one dimension and you maximize along another dimension. Okay, because you want the least cost, or you want the most profit, depending upon what your decision is derived from. All right. So the optimistic is pretty easy to do. The conservative kind of does the exact opposite. Oftentimes, the conservative case is called the worst case scenario. Right. So you're you're wanting to make sure that you. Um, 
take the worst case into account rather than the best case like the optimistic is. And so what's the worst case option? Low, medium, or high? High is the, your, your worst case scenario, so you're going to live in here. And if you know you're going to live in here, which lease should you choose in that scenario? C. You should choose C, because that's going to cost you the least of those three scenarios here. So the conservative says you should pick lease C. Okay? And this is going to often do a max min or mini max. Right? Which should sound a little bit more familiar. We used that terminology when we did the game theory. Right? You minimax across a column or a maxi min across a row. Right? So uh, depending upon if you're you're wanting to maximize profit or minimize cost will depend upon which one of you do, but you're going to have those opposing minimize first and then maximize or maximize first and then minimize to, to make that scenario. Okay, and these are these are things that a lot of people are familiar with. They have that kind of gut sense that this is how maybe we should make a, a decision. Uh, but we're going to introduce a third decision-making strategy um, here, which is called Minimax Regret, which is actually going to look not just at what happened, but we're going to um, do what most people do, is they look back and say, oh man, I wish I would have done this other option. Right? If only I had known what was going to happen, I would have picked option you know, Q, or whatever the case is. Okay, so this is going to specifically ask that question right there. What regret would you have if you picked this lease um, in, and then each one of these what are called states of nature, or each one of these um, scenarios played out? So I'm going to make a, a new table right here. So this might be called the payoff table, if this was a profit. Uh, but this is going to be what's called a regret table. Okay, and we're going to have um, three rows for each of our decisions that we can make here. And there are three scenarios that could take place. So we're going to have those same three columns here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start right here. Let's say we went with lease A. And what happened in the real world is that we actually ended up with a low mileage situation. How much regret are we going to encounter in that scenario? Why? we get the best result of the best option. Right. If we get low mileage, we wanted to end up with lease A. That's what happened. So there would be no regret in this scenario right here. Okay? But let's say instead we had bought lease B. What would be our regret in that scenario where we ended up driving low mileage but we purchased lease B. Would it be the difference between what it could have been? Yeah, it would be the difference between these two bucks. Oh man, I could have saved, well, let me get the exact number, 396 bucks if only I had gone with lease A. Right? So you have that regret. You have a tangible amount of regret that you know you could have saved almost $400 if you had made a different choice. How about with we see. Well, what would the, the regret be? It would be the difference between A and C, right? Yeah, that would be the difference between what we could have done and what we actually did. And in that case, it is nine hundred and thirty-six dollars. Okay. Do those three numbers make sense? Okay. So now. 
we go to the next scenario here. We have at least A, but now whatever happened, we ended up driving 15,000 miles a year. Okay? What would the regret be in that case? A minus B. Yeah, because B would have been the best solution now, right? So in fact, I'll jump down here and I'll just put zero here because right that would have been our happy uh, scenario. We pick at least B and we're like, oh, I drove 45,000 miles. I, I picked exactly the right thing, right? <laughs> um, but in this case, we have to subtract these two and we get 954. And in this scenario, we subtract these two right here and we get 540. Okay. Finally, what happens if instead of low mileage or medium mileage, we end up driving that high mileage scenario? Which one would we want to have picked? We would have wanted to pick C, so I'll put the zero in there. There would be no regret in that situation if we went with we C and we drove that mile. How about if we did A? It'd be the difference between C and A there, right? Which is 1,764. What about B? The difference between B and C. The difference between B and C, which is 1,260. Okay. So these are the <coughs> regrets that we could encounter with each scenario for each choice that we have to make. This is our choice along this axis right here. We choose which um, <coughs> lease to buy. <coughs> Down here, these are the states of nature, to, to use um, our book's terminology. Basically, these, at the time of our choice of which lease to buy, these are outside of our control. And we can't choose what future self is actually going to drive. Yes? So, so then can, can we do the, the total of those uh, regrets like on the side and then choose the best one, the one that has the least? Okay, so you, I like that you want to choose the least one. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the, the min from the minimax comes from. We want to minimize the regret that we might encounter. But the minimax regret doesn't sum them all up. What it does is it looks like, which one am I possibly going to really regret? Right? So what's the worst regret that choice A could encounter? Right here, right? How about B? And what about C? No. Low mileage. Low mileage. So if I write that off to the side, I could potentially regret up to 1764 if I make option A. I could regret up to 1260 with B, and I could regret 936 with option C. So this picking out this value represents the max part of the min and max option right here. So we could be in a really bad op, right, if we choose this option. We could really, man, I could have saved almost $2,000 here, right? That's potential to happen. Um, and this one, we could, own, the worst case scenario for our regret is that we almost uh, spent $1,000 more. So what we're going to do is after we get the maximum regret, across each choice, we're going to pick the one that is going to minimize that maximum regret, which is right here, at choice C. Right. And so, for the minimax regret, we're also going to pick C as the least option. Okay. These do not always give you the same answer. They both say minimax in it, but they're not minimaxing the same values. 
okay? So they do not necessarily come up with the same answer, like they did in this example here, okay? In this example, we assumed that each one of these options were equally likely to occur. What we're going to start looking at for the rest of the week is what happens if there are different probabilities of these different events. How do we then apply optimistic, conservative, and minimax regret to not just an equally likely scenario, but probabilistically likely scenarios, and how do we uh, make those decisions accordingly? All right? Have a great day. I'll see you on Wednesday.